should be finding the Gospel of Luke. Aren't you glad Jesus saves? Amen? It's good to look out and see some of our college students home uh, with us. Uh, we had some in the early service, and I see some here in the second service. What a blessing. What a blessing. All right. I know it's hot in here, so I'm going to be very brief. I see all of you fanning out there. Some of you now, you're saying, Preacher, it's cold in here. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll be brief this morning. Luke chapter number 1, if you're visiting with us today, we began two weeks ago, we missed last week, so we'll have to cut one of these messages out, but we're just looking uh, at the Christmas story around this theme, it's the most wonderful time of the year, and we're going to go right through New Year's uh, looking at uh, several messages uh, that'll, that'll uh, wrap up the year and lead us into the new year. The title of the message today is this. This is the second message in this series. It's entitled, Christmas is the Time for Good News. Christmas is the Time for Good News. I told the early service that uh, I was going to date myself this morning, and I'm going to date uh, some of y'all, but how many of you in here remember the Sears catalog. Anybody ever remember that coming to your house? Now these, these kids don't know nothing about a Sears catalog today, but the Sears catalog used to come to your house. and they, uh, You do know why they sent out the Sears catalog, don't you? They sent it out to take our money, amen? Uh, you could look through that catalog and there were everything from toys to tires to clothes to guns to golf clubs, some, some people called the Sears catalog a wish book. I remember one year sitting in my bedroom on my bed, and I don't remember the Sears catalog coming to our house very much, but for some reason this year we had one. I was, I, I guess I was probably eight or nine years old. Uh, my brother sitting back there, he was 27, I was, I was eight or nine. And I was looking through that Sears catalog, and, and I can remember turning down the corner. You know how you do that to, to keep where you are in your book? You turn down the corner of the page. Well, man, I had about ten corners turned down there in the Sears catalog of what I wanted. Now, I do know this. I may not have remembered the Sears catalog coming to our house, but I know when it quit coming, and it was after that Christmas. Amen? Because I had so many things picked out. But you know, when we opened our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 1, what we hold here in our hands is not a Sears catalog. Listen, matter of fact, it's not even a Santa's catalog. It is the Savior's catalog. The Bible is the Christian's Christmas catalog. Now listen to me. It's not full of garments and guns. It is full of grace and glory. It's not full of, of uh, appliances this morning. Listen, it, it's full of God's acceptance of sinners. No toy trucks in the Word of God. Just God's truth. You see, on every page of the Bible, on every page of Santa's catalog or the Savior's catalog, you will find treasures and you will find gifts and you will find fulfilled promises just for you. And I'll find them just for me. However, as you look through the Savior's catalog, you're not going to find now outside, out beside one of these gifts or beside one of these treasures or beside one of these promises, you're not going to find a price tag. You're not going to find a price list. You see, every promise, every gift, every treasure that you find in the Word of God has been paid in full by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there are no layaway plans in here. There are no payment plans. There are no payment options. All the treasures in the Savior's catalog have been paid in full by God's precious Son and they were paid for by by the blood of God. Amen. Now, the Bible is not a wish book. The Bible is a wonder book. And as we'll see in our text this morning, the Bible tells us that Christmas is the time of good news. And that good news has been delivered to you and to me. I want you to stand in honor and reverence of the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, infallible word beginning in verse number 26 of Luke 1. I 
I've got a splitting headache right now. Let's pray, okay? Father, I just pray right now, Lord, you'd give me clarity of mind. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd ease this headache. Pray, Lord, that there would be no obstacle in here that would keep us from hearing from you. Lord Jesus, may our minds and our focus be stayed on the message right now in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. verse 26, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin. Now, if your Bible says to a young woman, that's, that's not the correct translation. The Bible says to a virgin espoused or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the house of bread. Amazing that the bread of life would be born in the house of bread. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. I've never had sexual relations with a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, your cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called Darren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. I just believe, I just believe Gabriel got excited right there when he said that. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from him. Christmas is the time for good news. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Now I want you to notice several things with me this morning concerning Christmas being the time of good news. First thing that I want you to write down this morning, if you're taking notes, and I always encourage our church to do that, but if you're taking notes this morning, here's what I want you to write down. Here's what I see in our text this morning. Number one, God dispatched Gabriel with his good news. There's an angel by the name of Gabriel that was dispatched from heaven with the greatest news ever announced. We just read it there in verse 26 and 27. I went through, and I even did it out here with our adults several years ago, went through a study of angels in the Bible. I, I, I cut it off with our young people. Something happened, we got cut off. But I was teaching them about angels from the Word of God as well. There, there are different types of, of angels in the Bible. There are military angels. There are messenger angels. There, there are angels that are always around when miracles take place. But uh, Gabriel is one of God's special angelic agents. God, uh, Gabriel is one of those messenger angels. I told the early service, he was kind of like God's paper boy in the Bible. He's always bearing a message from God. Gabriel means God is powerful. And if you study the Word of God, you'll realize that everywhere Gabriel went, in some way, in some manner, he is declaring that God is powerful. His very presence, when he showed up, his very presence said God is powerful. I mean, when Gabriel showed up, he reminded everybody that was there that our God is a powerful God. Now, the Bible says, if you turn back... Uh, in, in Luke chapter 1, you go to the preceding verses of where we began. Gabriel comes to Zacharias and Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, and gave them the same news, in essence, uh, other than the Savior was to be born. Uh, Gabriel also told them that they were going to have a child who, who you and I know is John the Baptist. Now, Zacharias was a priest. His wife's name was Elizabeth. Uh, 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 Zacharias and Elizabeth, they both loved the Lord a great deal. 
They loved one another a great deal. And they would have loved to have had children. But if you go back to Luke chapter 1 and verse 7, look at it. In verse number 7, the Bible says, and they had no child. Because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. They were well advanced in years. They were past those childbearing years. Now, guess who shows up one day down there at the church? Down there at the temple where uh, Zacharias is working and he's doing his priestly duties. Oh, Gabriel, God's angelic messenger. The angel that comes and announces the power of Almighty God. Gabriel comes down there. And the Bible says in verse number 11, look at it in Luke 1. And there appeared unto Zacharias an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And so Gabriel, he comes and he delivers a message from heaven. He's delivering a message uh, uh, from God himself through his angel Gabriel. And look at what he says in verse number 13. But the angel said unto him, said unto Zacharias, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now I guarantee you, I guarantee you in that moment, you just imagine Zacharias there, down at the church, down at the temple, he's doing God's business, and I, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, Zacharias, he probably was not unaccustomed to uh, seeing uh, strange things, miraculous things. And, and I just suppose, or, or just imagine, he's down there and he's doing his priestly duties and all of a sudden he hears uh, an angelic voice being the voice of Gabriel and Gabriel begins to give him this news. Now, you have to remember that uh, uh, Zacharias and, and, and Elizabeth, there, and men don't ever say this about your wife, well stricken in years. Elizabeth was well stricken in years. And by the way, so was Zacharias. And, and, but but the ain't Gabriel begins to tell, tell him about having a son. I guarantee you in that moment, this was a head-scratching moment. I mean, I, I just see him, you know. <laughs> what, what did you say? No, 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 what he sa Notice what he says in verse number 18. Here's how Zacharias responds to the message. He says, And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? What in the world are you talking about? For I am an old man. Here it is. Words you don't want to speak. And my wife, well stricken in years. He's just an old man. She's well stricken. Boy, that just sounds bad, don't it? My wife is well stricken in years now. Bible says in verse 19, look at it. The angel answering and said unto him, I am Gabriel, to stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Listen, when Gabriel, as I said a moment ago, when Gabriel is seen in Scripture, and I'll show you this uh, more in a moment, but most of the time, when he comes, he comes exclaiming, the power of Almighty God. Now here's what interests me very much. That when he came to Zacharias, he met Zacharias down there in the church. I thought about this two weeks ago when I was studying for this message. Listen, I'm telling you this morning that the average Baptist church in America knows very little about the power of God in their midst. And the little that they know doesn't do enough for them to even give a holy grunt in the church. Amen? I just believe that every now and then we need a Gabriel to come in here and to remind us of the glory and the majesty and the power of our God. We need a special visit from God and be mindful to us that He is all powerful. Listen to what I'm saying to you this morning. When people walk out of here on Sunday, I don't want them just going out and patting me on the back and saying, Preacher, that message really spoke to me. Preacher, that was such a good sermon. Listen, I, I don't want people going out of here and saying, Man, did you... Did you hear that solo? Is that choir? They really
really rung the bell of heaven. Hey, they have done good today. It has been good in here today. Maybe you heard a testimony in Sunday school. That testimony is good. But even more than that, I want people to walk out of here and say, you know what? God was in that place today. The power of God fell on that place today. The power of God got on the preacher today and he preached the Word of God in the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, every time a person walks the aisle in Blue Ridge View Baptist Church and receive Christ as Savior and Lord of their life, I'm telling you that's just shouting that God is all powerful. Every time a person goes through the baptismal waters, those waters are just saying God is powerful. Hey, listen, when a marriage is restored, every time somebody rededicates their life, every time a life is set aside for full-time gospel ministry, it is just proclaiming that God is powerful. Amen. Do you notice in verse 19? We're told that Gabriel stood in the presence of God. Here's what I've learned. If you want to be greatly used of God, if you truly want the power of God in your life and on your life, then start spending some time in the presence of God. God dispatched Gabriel with his good news. But here's the second thing, notice. Gabriel delivered that good news. Gabriel delivered that. What an amazing, life-altering, world-changing announcement that Gabriel was given to proclaim. Now, he has a special announcement from God for Mary. In fact, if you read it carefully, it's really a two-fold announcement. I want you to see something here. Look at verse 28. Here is God's estimation of Mary. Notice what he says. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now there are some, and some have even built a religious system on this. But there are some that take that to mean that Mary was blessed above women. But that's not, that's not, read your Bible, that's not what uh, Gabriel says here. He did not say that Mary was blessed above women. He said, Mary, you are highly favored among women. Amen. Now we men sometimes like to remind the women that they're the ones that brought sin into this world. But I want to remind you this morning that it was also a woman who brought the Savior into this world. Amen? Amen. Now what is it, what is it, what is it that Gabriel meant when he referred to Mary in verse 28 as being highly favored? It literally means you could read this to say thou art much graced. That's what highly favored means. You are much graced. You see, God dealt with Mary on the same basis that He deals with us. He deals with us by His grace. That's how He dealt with Mary. Let me tell you how Mary one day died and went to heaven. It's because of the grace of God. Yeah, without God's grace, you and I wouldn't have any pardon for our past sins. Without God's grace, we wouldn't have any power to live in the present for Jesus. Without God's grace and forgiveness, we would have no prospect, no hope for the future. Now I want you to listen how, how John, you know I love John. But here's how John described the coming of Jesus in the flesh in John 1.14. The Bible says, And the Word became flesh, speaking of Jesus, yes. and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes. And then he goes down in, in, in verse 16, he said, and, and of His fullness we have all received, listen to this, and grace for grace, or literally grace upon grace. You know what grace is? Someone has said grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve security. I don't deserve being sealed until the day of redemption. But listen to me. Our salvation is by grace. Our sealing is by grace. Our security in the arms of God is by grace. No wonder rejoicing was the theme when Gabriel spoke to Mary. Rejoice. She was much graced by God. Listen, you know if you know Christ as your Savior, it's because you've been much graced, much graced by God. Now notice Mary's response. 
response in verse 29. And notice what she says. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Look at verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Aren't you glad for those words, fear not? Put, put your name out there. It'd be good. For thou hast found favor with God. Literally, you have found grace with God. You know what will remove fear in your life this morning? The grace of God. That's what the Christmas celebration is all about. Really, God's saving grace. God's settling grace. God's living grace. Man, I'm glad God gives me grace to live every single day. But it's not just living grace, it's dying grace. Amen? I'm glad I, I, I know one day when I'm drawing my last breath, my fleeting breath, I know and I believe based on the promise of the Word of God, He's going to give me dying grace. But I also notice here, not only His estimation of Mary, but His announcement to Mary. God's announcement to Mary. And notice what he says. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Now listen. Zacharias, when Gabriel spoke to him, it was a head scratching moment. When he spoke to Mary, that's a passing out moment. Amen. I mean, you're going to conceive a child. She had been selected by Almighty God to bring forth the Savior into this world. My word. Amen. She's instructed to name the child Jesus. It's a Hebrew name, Joshua. It means Jehovah saves. Remember Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall what? Save his people from their sins. Listen. That baby to be born was to be called the Son of God because he was the Son of God. Preacher, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you saying that a virgin conceived in her womb? No. No. I'm saying that the Word of God says that a virgin conceived in her womb. Big difference. Amen. People come to me all the time. Well, preacher, tell me what you think about this. Preacher, what do you think about this transgender issue? Preacher, what do you think about this homosexuality issue? Preacher, what do you think about this race issue? Preacher, what do you think about this issue and that? Don't matter what I think. What does the Word of God say? Man, that settles everything. Skeptics say, is it possible for a virgin to conceive and have a child? Well, let's let the good news angel answer that. Verse 37, he is very plain. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. If you believe that, say amen. I'm telling you, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ is based on this principle. Nothing shall be impossible with God. The power of God is the principle, the point, the performance of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But notice, notice in verse number 35. Here's the power that made the virgin birth happen. Look at it. Verse 35, the Bible says, The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Don't miss it now. The power behind the virgin birth was the Holy Spirit of God. The third person of the Godhead. Here's the principle of the virgin birth. Nothing shall be impossible with God. Here's the power of the virgin birth. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. I'm telling you this morning, you cannot come away with but one conclusion about Jesus Christ, and that is Jesus was God in the flesh. Like Father, like Son. Amen? Amen. God dispatched Gabriel with His good news. Gabriel delivered God's good news. And then third of all, look at it, Mary declared her acceptance. This is important. Of God's good news. Look at verse 38. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me. Be it unto me according to thy word. The angel departed from her. Now listen. She may have not understood, and I, I'm, I'm certain she didn't. She probably didn't understand this news from Gabriel that had been dispatched from God with this message. It 
may have confused her, probably astonished her. Don't you know it made her fearful? You ever got news that astonished you? You ever gotten any news that confused you? You ever gotten any news that caused fear in your life, caused your heart to beat, caused you to have anxiety like my Sunday school teacher talked about this morning? You ever got any news like that? Mary's response to the message of God was this. Let it be. Be it unto me according to thy word. This is your message for me. I accept. It's incomprehensible, but I accept this word from God. You know what? I don't believe Mary had to accept it. Mary could have said, you know what? I'm not even what the long-tongued Sally's would have to say about that in the community. I'll just end this pregnancy. She could have aborted. But rather than ending that pregnancy, she accepted the message of God. Could I tell you something this morning? The greatest thing you will ever do in this life is to accept God's will. Do God's will for your life. Some of you in here this morning, you have been praying about something. You have been on your knees. And you have been seeking God's will. You've been seeking God's direction. You have gotten into His Word. And you believe that you have received His will for your life. Listen to me. Get up off of your knees. Don't debate it. Don't deny it. Don't uh, uh, fiddle around with it. Get up off your knees and do it. Do the will of God. Follow what He wants you to do. You can never go wrong. You will never get lost. I don't care where it takes you. I don't care what it has you doing. You cannot go wrong doing the will of God. Somebody needed that this morning. Verse 38 tells us that after hearing the acceptance of Mary then, Gabriel departed her. I told the early crowd, I got to think about that. Where, where'd he go preaching? Well, I'll tell you where I think Gabriel went. I believe Gabriel made his way back to heaven shouting, Mary said, let it be so. Mary accepts the message. She's going to have uh, uh, the Savior. Uh, she's going to give birth to the Savior of the world. Now listen carefully as I close. It takes more of God's love and grace to save a sinner than it did for him to send his son. Please hear me again. It takes more of God's love and grace to save a sinner than it did for him to send his son. You see, creation was no problem to God. Remember the Bible says He spoke and it was done. Amen? You believe that? Amen. Red Sea, parting, no problem. Keeping Jonah alive in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, it's child's play to God. The virgin birth was no big problem to God. The only time God ever went to any trouble is when He sent His Son. die for your sin and my sin. Calvary was the place where His virgin born Son was nailed to a cross so that we might be saved. Mary accepted the Word of God. She then followed the will of God. And young Mary gave birth to the Son of God. Now I want to ask everybody in here this morning are you as a committed Christian, are you as a committed Christian doing what you know God wants you to do right now? Are you as a committed Christian doing what you know God expects you to be doing right now? Doing what you know He deserves for you to be doing right now. You see, God sent His Son to die in order for us to be saved. There really is no excuse for us not living for Him. Could I get an amen right there? Amen. Next week, most of us, we're going to gather somewhere. At some point, we'll probably gather around in the living room around the Christmas tree and probably swap presents one with another. It's what we do at my mom and dad's house. But I, I want to remind you this morning, when, when you sit around that Christmas tree and you're swapping gifts, 
Be mindful that the real Christmas tree had more than lights on it. It had the light of the world. The real Christmas tree was a cross stained with the blood of God. 1 Peter 2.24 Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sin, I live under righteousness by whose stripes you are. Heads bowed, eyes.